This is WPSL Port St. Lucie, the talk of the Treasure Coast. The views expressed on the following program might just so be those of WPSL, but you can't tell. We can't say that. We have to say the views expressed on this program are not necessarily those of WPSL. But I will say this. You are encouraged to like and share them on Facebook because it's time for Issues and Answers in St. Lucie County with your host, Mark Gotts. Good evening. We like to examine the different issues that uh, affect our community and have open discussions with uh, guests on these issues. And our format for the show is simple. I go through this every week, but first half hour will be a discussion with subject or subjects with our invited guests. Uh, the second half hour will be open to calling questions on issues that you feel you need answers. And just to remind you, our phone number for calls is 772-340-1590. We've, we've covered several subjects uh, on the show over the last month. We had uh, the county in here with uh, Kathy Townsend. We had small businesses with Mike Milady. We've had the new charter school with Sandy Krisky. And tonight, we're moving back to governments and the city of Port St. Lucie. We're very, very fortunate this evening to have uh, our District 2 Commissioner, which is, uh, my, I, I'm sorry, our District 2 Councilman, who is also uh, my Councilman for the City of Port St. Lucie, John Carvelli. John, welcome to the show. Thank you, Mark. It's a pleasure to be here. You know, uh, you've been on the City Council now. You were elected, I guess, in 2016, and there were a lot of issues and things that went on before 2016 that uh, I used to get up and talk a lot about at City Council meetings. Uh, a lot of people ask me why I'm not there so much anymore, and I, I think it's because of the election of 2016. Uh, we were very fortunate uh, to get three new council seats, and the council has now become, I think, more business business friendly and and more uh, into the dollars and cents of the city, making a big difference, I believe. So, what are some of the important initiatives that have started on the city council since you joined in 2016? Well, Mark, thank you again. It's a pleasure to be here. John Carbelli speaking. I want to say regarding the council, I think as a council we've become more driven by efficiency and hoping that we can run an efficient, high-quality government that serves the community. And um, some of the initiatives that we started when I got there in 2016, and I do not take credit for all of these because it is a team effort, we are working to sell the VGTI building. Obviously, that's first and foremost. We want to remove that assessment cost and that and that um, sales t and that t annual taxes that we pay on it and the annual maintenance from our from our budget. We want to try to get that away, and we want to get it back into play as an economic machine for that that portion of the community that will help develop some bioscience jobs. Now, on that VGTI building, what is the uh, what is the annual carry on that thing just to maintain it because it's a very special. Yeah. Building. It runs between a million and a million five. We have to pay a special special assessment district, community development district, and then because there's specialized systems throughout the building with regards to air conditioning, compressed rooms, they're high maintenance and it's very expensive. I will tell you that that is a priority of ours to get it back into the business workforce so that it could help create jobs and be off our payrolls. Yes, I know you're working on a deal on that. Uh, I know you probably can't mention too much about yeah. it, but how long? How how is it coming along? Well, I feel pretty good right now. We we approved accepting. Uh, I, an offer from RER Enterprises. The uh, man, Mr. Kalalukas, Kalavukas, he has built buildings in Arlington, Virginia. He did the FIU dorm buildings down there in Miami. He had an excellent track record for nearly 40 years. One of the things that impressed me was he said he'd never been in uh, foreclosure, bankruptcy, or sued. And he's been able to bring projects home in the right budget. But most importantly, he made us an offer at the full appraised value, $14.5 million, and we will stand to get about two and a half additional million dollars in um, interest over the five years. It's a balloon note at the end. We still hold title. In the event something did happen and the building revert to us, we have some upfront money that would help us there. 
And once again, by getting that in his hands and operational so that he can use it as a bioscience building, we don't have to worry about paying the assessments on it, any taxes on it, or um, any maintenance fees on it. So basically, he's going to he's going to be a for profit business that takes mm -hmm. over that building. So that means it comes back onto the tax roll. Absolutely, that's well, the goal. That's, that's great. That'll help the citizens for sure. We are also, um, like I mentioned earlier, debt pay down is a priority. Since I've been there, we've paid down about two hundred and twenty million dollars in debt through refinancings. I'm proud to say I was one of those who made a motion one day to use some reserve funds to pay off some debt. So that has always been a goal. Our rating continues to get better, and it's actually quite high now. We were informed the other night that we've been reevaluated, and our credit rating went up again. Mm -hmm. So in the future, if we do have to borrow money, we'll have a higher credit rating. Um, we are working to fix some issues that were created in the past, and we understand that. And it does seem at times like we get a lot of momentum, and then we're back pedaling a little to clean up an issue that occurred from a prior decision. Um, well, well, that's, typi that's typical running a business, and let's yeah. face it, uh, our governments are really businesses. Uh, they're supported by the taxpayers, and obviously the better they're run, uh, the less the taxpayers have to uh, support them. Well, speaking of the taxpayers, Mark, very happy to say the other night we passed another tenth of a millage decrease in taxes. It'll be the second year I've been on there and the third year in a row total that we're able to pass off a tax break instead of raising taxes or holding them even. You know, this does go back to the original tax increase several years ago mm -hmm. that was made by a prior council because... They were in a pinch, but our goal is to, because we did see increased valuation, we actually had an 11.4% increase in the valuation of Port St. Lucie. So we said, let's pass off any remaining excess funds back to the taxpayers above our budgeted amount. And we, we've been growing very conservatively, very frugally. We look at every position we add as is it needed? What's the um, long term? What, is it there to stay? Can we fund it? Can we sustain it? Other things that we are working on is the riverfront development, uh, Riverwalk on uh, Westmoreland, West yeah. which, you know, once again, as a city councilman, I approach it as I don't represent the whole, just my district, but rather the whole city. So I'm very happy to say that getting the riverfront development off the ground, we did begin to move the historical homes from the Verano property that were the Peacock Ranch Lodge and another building, and we're starting to bring those over. We hope to get a restaurant to anchor that river, that river par riverfront park, mm -hmm. build a park within it. We just opened up Woodland Woodland Park on off of uh, Ga off of Becker Road. It's a beautiful park. Has a doggy park inside it. Has play areas for children, bike racks, sidewalks. That's it's, it's well treed. Uh, you know, on Kashmir, we just uh, corrected an issue with sound, and we added a, long, a two and a, um, a half mile long length of palm trees, firebush, and uh, pine trees to rebuild that, but create a beautiful walking park. Then, of course, the big one is the Crosstown Parkway. That is the one everyone is waiting for. That's going to bring the city together from east to west. Very happy to say we got a report the other night. They actually said that the bridge would be done in August. But Village Green Drive, getting that constructed to handle the flow of traffic off the bridge may cause a delay. But we are pushing to get it done as early as possible. Now, the target date's November. August, uh, you're saying August. Is uh, August of this year? Nin 19. 19. Okay. August of so 19. We're, so the bridge is about Sorry a about year that. away from opening yes. up. And uh, hopefully that will take some of the traffic off of uh, St. Lucie. Lucie West Boulevard, which is uh, – which is our area to fight every day. That's where we where we live around. And I'm uh, very happy to say that it will make the ride from Verano to US-1 a very short commute. And like you mentioned, take all that pressure off of PSL Boulevard, off of St. Lucie West and Prima Vista Boulevards. Mm -hmm. um, we are working on, let me see what else we have here, Mark, accepting a transfer of 1,250 acres from Tradition Land Company uh, prior council had guaranteed essentially the assessments on this, so we had to make a, a decision on it whether to accept the land or to let it go into a, somewhat of a tax sale, which would be three years unused, mm -hmm. and we would still be stuck paying it. We did accept the tran. We are ex in the process of accepting the transfer, and at the same time, we're putting RFPs out there. Oh, oh. We're putting some RFPs out there to accept proposals from people 
to do things. And one of the things we see going in there is a an Oculus. It's Oculus, a firm that makes surgical equipment for ophthalmologists. Mm -hmm. That's coming in. A wire company is coming in that it makes specialized wires like for airplanes. So we're going to have some manufacturing going on, low-level light manufacturing going on there along that corridor of I-95 from tradition to the county, south to the county line. So we're real happy with that. That should be uh, a, a good addition. Uh, are they going to need uh, trained personnel, or will they be training the personnel that are in those light manufacturing businesses? Well, they mentioned that. As a matter of fact, we asked them the other day how they would uh, how they would receive getting trained personnel from a possible vo career and technical school that could be based there in Southern Groves. Mm -hmm. And that may lead into one of our questions, if you want me to talk about it. Yeah, we'll get to that. Okay. <clears throat> I, well, it's budget time overall, and you said that we're going to get a little bit of a budget break on the millage yeah. this uh, this year. What is the total size of the uh, budget for the city of Port St. Lucie now? Okay. The proposed budget for the upcoming year is four hundred and ten million seven hundred forty one thousand dollars, and our we had a general fund increase of nine percent, which was approximately. Um, nine million dollars, right around there. Mm -hmm. But that was due to increased valuation. I uh, want to report that we do spread, spend our money wisely. We add very few positions. Most are built around safety and security of the city. We are the safest large city, we're very happy to say, in Florida. We are eighth in size in Florida's eighth largest city, and there's a very good chance we are going to surpass Tallahassee and be the seventh largest city before long. So we're a growing city, yet we still want to maintain that small town feel so we know who our neighbors are, and we want to have a safe city, a beautiful city. We are looking at making sure we add sidewalk and repave our roads appropriately because repaving plans are something I have focused on. The other day we spent a large amount of time at the retreat talking about our repaving schedule, and they're around 20, 22 years on road life. We want to make sure we're always in a repaving mode so that we don't wind up with roads that are falling apart, and then the citizens will really be unhappy. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they do. If they have to drive the roads and they're either overcrowded or they're full of potholes, yeah. they, it does cause a lot of problems with the citizens. Do you get a lot of calls uh, at the city uh, from our area as far as either roads or traffic congestion? Traffic. We do get a lot of calls in St. Lucie West related to traffic. I will be honest with you. Port St. Lucie Boulevard related to traffic. Um, in terms of the road condition, we don't get a lot of complaints. We address those issues quickly if we do, and we make sure they're repaired. Um, one of the things we do get a lot of calls on is clearing lots. And that's a homeowner responsibility or a lot owner responsibility. So we're trying to put a plan in place that notifies a lot owner about expecting them to clear the lot and not allow overgrown branches to come onto their neighbor's yards. Right. I know. I think you passed an ordinance uh, several months ago on that as far as uh, in, in encroachment and, and being able to go in there and, I guess, clear the lots and then... Um, Put a, a, a lien or, or an assessment build against them. the lot. Yeah, build them. Yeah, build them for it. Yeah, I don't think we're at the point where we're going to be I, about putting the uh, a lien on them. But you know, if we have them coming through the wires and it's going to be a safety hazard, we mm -hmm. have to get these things addressed, you know, quickly. But we we don't get a lot of complaints in the city council office. Oftentimes, we have a good listening audience on our city council uh, uh, televised shows. We actually get calls for clarification. You know, and they want to know more about things. I think we have a very informed uh, citizenship in Port St. Lucie. And I will tell you, we had a citizen summit this year, and we had an excellent turnout, and we let the citizens give input on what was important to them. And a lot of it was built around education, believe it or not. Now, the, the input that you got from them uh, was basically, uh, I would assume, to, to work into some type of strategic plan. Mm-hmm. And uh, you guys have been uh, working, I believe, on a strategic plan for a while. Those are something that you work on, and then you try to meet that strategic plan over a period of time, and then you readdress it several years later to try to uh, every know, year. go forward. Yeah. Every year you're, you're addressing we look at the strategic it every plan? Year. Let me tell you a little about strategic plan. Sure. What are your, what are your major the issues? Strategic the plan strategic plan was a priority of mine when I got there. Mm -hmm. And as it was the mayor and several of the other council members bought into it and realized that having measurable goals and objectives in city government is a good thing to have. Mm -hmm. And it focuses everybody. And it helps you allocate your resources. Obviously, we wanted to be a safe city. 
we, we, one of our other goals was to have A and B rated schools. And though we have no responsibility for running the schools, we sent resolution to the school board stating exactly that. We wanted A and B rated schools in the city. And at this time, we have A and B rated schools. One of the charter schools, the lower school that was just acquired, might be a C this year. But we had a lot of positive growth in school quality this year that we're starting to see, uh, especially with charter school, Somerset College Prep Academy was rated as one of the four best on the Treasure Coast and got a silver medal by Time Magazine. So the charter schools do count towards the district's rating, mm -hmm. and we're very happy to say that many of our charter schools are doing quite well, and our traditional schools are starting to see that improvement mindset is critical so that if we have quality, improving schools, schools will be able to attract businesses to our community and yeah. yes I know that education has become uh, a main issue uh, of the City Council and, and you've got a lot of experience in that but uh, I think we may be cutting off for a commercial yeah. break shortly yeah. and I'd like to pick that up when we come back uh, as a situation because uh, how many years did you spend on the school school board 16 years 16 years on the school board so you've got a little bit of background there I'd like to hear more about that after our commercial break. Thank you, John. If as a woman, you believe that you can accomplish all that a man can accomplish and more without the help of the government, you just might be a Republican. If you believe that you should have a say in your child's education and that you should have a choice as to where your child is educated, you just might be a Republican. To learn more, go to stlucygop.org and click on Being a Republican. The Republican Party of St. Lucie invites you to meet your Republican candidates on Saturday, August 11th from noon till 4 p.m. at the Port St. Lucie Civic Center. Candidates from the school board to U.S. Congress and in between will be on hand. Come ask questions and get answers. No spin, no fake news, just you and the candidates. Get informed, be informed, vote informed. For more information, go to stlucygop.org. Paid for by the Republican Party of St. Lucie, not connected with any specific candidate. This is WPSL Port St. Lucie, the talk of the Treasure Coast. You're listening to Issues and Answers in St. Lucie County. Once again, here's your host, Mark Gotts. Welcome back. Uh, I'd like to remind our listeners that our guest tonight is John Carvelli, City Councilman for the City of Port St. Lucie. Uh, John has joined us tonight and we'll be taking uh, calls at the bottom of the hour. Again, our phone number is 772-340-1590. And we were just beginning to talk about uh, schools. Uh, and, of course, uh, I had mentioned John has a long history of schools because he was on the school district for 16 years. School board. School board. So um, now that the, the city is really kind of focused on schools and there's been a lot of uh, concern about security at schools and and uh, making sure that our children are safe uh, when they're getting their education. Yep. I know the city's been quite involved in that, and uh, there's there's a lot of discussion back and forth on that. Can you kind of bring us up to date with where the uh, city is uh, as compared to the school district, as compared to uh, uh, the sheriff's office? I mean, I think those are concerns for our uh, listeners f who have students who will be, uh, yeah. you know, heading back to school shortly. Well, I'm not going to speak for the school board or the sheriff's office, but I will let you know that on the city council, we have made school quality a priority and school safety a priority as well. Very happy to state that we are paying for five positions this year and we will uh, help staff the high schools in Port St. Lucie as well as Somerset Academy, which is a high school. The, five, the four public traditional high schools and the one charter school. We'll provide uh, school um, Port St. Lucie police officers. There. I know you're, you've, uh, you've had a uh, Port St. Lucie police officer at uh, Somerset. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, I think for the last couple of years, haven't you? I believe so. I mean, have you guys been uh, been covering a lot of areas as far as safety in the uh, yeah. Port St. Lucie area? With I'll the- tell you a little more. Okay. We are um, also helping the, at the school board's request last year. We had a joint meeting with them. Since arriving at the city council, I've tried to promote having some joint meetings with the school board so we could see what their needs are and they can understand what our needs are in the, in the city with regards to the city residents. And we've also helped to pay for truancy officers out in the parks areas to do to assist the school district as well as a safety coordinator a non-sworn law office law enforcement officer so overall our commitments about a million a little over a million dollars and very happy to say we're part of supporting school safety well it's a very important part i know with the uh, 400 million that they allocated from the state uh, budget this year towards strengthening uh, our schools Uh, doing a lot of mental health work, and also providing those student resource officers. I know that uh, the governor wanted a school resource officer in every Every school. school. So I know that the middles and the highs have been somewhat covered in the past. Now getting it into the elementary schools is going to be a little bit larger lift. It's a statewide. Yeah. It's becoming a statewide issue in securing these officers. But very happy to say that. You know, once again, try to be a safe city and and working together with the school the school district is important and working of course with the sheriff's office to make sure we're always communicating that's another priority our our police departments are a strong police department they they were the ones who had a strategic plan with measurable objectives when i first got there and i had a chance to meet with chief bolduck who did a really strong job of focusing his department on what needs to get done you know i think did we talk about um the Votech Center. Well, uh, we were talking about the budget, and I think we've just about finished yeah. with the budget. Uh, have you? Are you adding many FTEs, uh, full-time no, employees? No, I you think it was pretty, pretty seven to nine. Seven to nine, and and a couple or or two or three of those were police officers. Okay. I thought it was two or three were police officers, and also I found out the other day at the retreat we are, we only have two unfilled police positions. So Port St. Lucie is a popular place to work. That's, and that's pretty good because that's I know they're good. looking for police officers. Obviously, uh, in total, uh, everybody is looking for uh, labor in today's marketplace. We have 1,097 employees, and it was an approximately 12 increase. And I believe some of those were in the building department. The building department collects fees, and they fund their own positions. So it's not coming out of the general fund, the taxpayer dollars. It's coming out of fees they they did. It was the building fund, utility. Mm -hmm. Utility fund also covered some of those expenses. We have an excellent utility department. I know utility and both building are enterprise uh, uh, funds. Enterprise funds. And so they basically support themselves with the fees that they gather uh, from the citizens, whether it's the building department or the uh, water and sewer department. Looks like we have our first call of the night. Uh, we've got Steve on line one. Steve, are you there? Dr. Carvelli, how are you all doing today? How are you, sir? Doing well. My Speak right into the phone so we can hear you real good, okay? All right. My name is Steve Allen. I'm a uh, on Fort St. Lucie. I wanted to thank Dr. Carvelli and the city council for uh, supporting the idea of a career technical school here in Fort St. Lucie. This uh, obviously will be a benefit to our children, to our businesses, a benefit to our economy overall. And I am completely in support of this issue, especially as a resident of Port St. Lucie. My question for Dr. Carvelli is how long do you think it will take to develop a plan and find charter school partners to complete a project like this? Well, that's a great question, Steve. I appreciate your calling in. Um, Mr. Allen has brought up an excellent point. He's uh, asked what the timeline is to get a a career academy or a career technical school out of the ground, built, and ready to go. Well, typically, charter schools follow a February 1st deadline to turn in their their application, and then it's evaluated for a period of about 90 days. The city is accelerating the timeline to identify the land needed so that they can kind of set it aside for someone. But my guess is it would be a year from 2019 startup probably about an August 2020 if we could have everything pulled together and it flows well, wouldn't you say, Mr. Gotts? Yes, that that sounds like it would be a logical progression because your your charter, as you said, has to be in the application 
for February 1st. The district has 90 days to review it. Uh, usually they take a little more than that. And then if they do approve it, you get into a situation where you've got to then negotiate a charter contract. So all in all, uh, it'll take six or seven months just to move that through. And then, of course, design and building That's vocational right. school is going to take you probably a year. So you're looking at an August 2020. In August 2020, with everything coming together perfectly, to, to say it, because well, like you brought up an excellent point, a career technical school may be a little more technical in nature than a typical uh, straight academic uh, school, K-8 school or a 9 through 12 school. So there's going to be some additional design elements that they're going to have to look over with regards to the types of programs they offer. They're going to have to have things running concurrently to pull off a tight timeline like that and mark i believe they're entitled to an extra year now with the new state statute to um if they don't get the school open um, well actually the new charter school contract which i've just had a opportunity to review recently uh will actually give you up to three years now right. to defer so <clears throat> if you can't open the first year you do get to defer a year and one of the things about the uh vocational tech school here is I think we need to really look at what are the requirements of the businesses in yeah. the areas. I know I speak to a number of contractors, and they just can't get qualified help anymore, either in any of the trades, whether it be electric, plumbing, masonry. Uh, we're losing our tradesmen, and, the, and, and their uh, ability and understanding uh, of how to do these jobs is not being passed down. This is not necessarily something you can get in a book. So it's uh, in, important to try to get these artisans and have them pass that down yeah. to students. And I think we need to make uh, the community aware, especially the student community, uh, how important it is, first of all, to have a trade and, and how financially rewarding it can be. Uh, we won't have any people to repair HVA systems or plumbing or electricity if we keep running on the uh, uh, on what we're doing now I think that we're we put we're putting something out in the near future to begin accepting proposals from it could be the school board it could be the state college it could be a charter operator we're very open-minded on this it could be a private a school that a private um, school that wants to turn uh, do something along the lines of a charter school and recognizing that the school board would do the approval on the charter and that we are hoping to see something aligned with the job growth over the next 10 years that's the key to success in, in career technical schools and career academy schools is that you look at the job growth in your region in your county and you try to align the programs you'll be offering for students so that there's a natural progression to go out of the career to academy school, possibly to two year two year school for a certificate, AS degree program, and then enter the workforce at a higher wage. That's the ultimate goal: is to get our our kids entering the workforce at higher wages and getting um, job security of having had quality training. You know, well, absolutely. When you and when you have that training, because we're not the only uh, area in the country that is short of labor right now. I mean, you've got this throughout the country, so anyone who learns all of this uh, and, and can absorb and come out and be fruitful to a uh, potential employer uh, can basically go anywhere they want in the country and work. Mark, I'd like and to say something. Oops, sorry. Oh, I was going to say, this brings me to another question that I had. Do, uh, uh, do you all believe, and as, as I do, that a school like this has the ability to attract students from outside of our county, say Martin County, Indian River County, Okeechobee yeah. County, to be able to come in and learn these trade skill sets? Well, the statute for charter schools does allow crossing the county lines, and it could become a bit of a regional school. We just want to see what the proposals are brought in. I like to say something. Having lived in Port St. Lucie since 1973 and being involved in the local economy, in high school I worked construction, laying concrete all over the city with a, co with a company all the way through high school, through college. I could tell you that the local economy was originally built upon construction trade jobs. People worked in, in Port St. Lucie. As the boom, the current boom cycle would take off, they'd, get, they'd build homes. If they had to, they commuted to Palm Beach County and worked on projects down there. And when the bottom fell out 
of the local construction economy, people moved. They moved away. What we want to do is avoid that as we attract businesses to our business park that we're building along the corridor on I-95. We want to try to bring in jobs that are sustainable through recessions and economic slowdowns and not just build our local economy on construction trade jobs. I hope to see a proposal that takes into account construction trade jobs and preparing people, health occupations, a variety of other occupations that will be part of our future economy in Port St. Lucie. I think that will make for a, for a great school, and I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing the proposals that you get uh, from the city. Uh, Steve, thank you very much for your call. We, uh, we have another one now. Mark, I'd like to finish up on one thing. Sure. Since this was discussed the other day, we, I have gotten nothing but positive feedback everywhere. Everywhere I go, people must have been tuned into our retreat. And then, of course, there was that great news article about it. Mm -hmm. I have had nothing but positive feedback. And I, people are calling me. They're stopping me in public, stopping me in Walmart, talking to me. We're excited about this. It was 8 out of 10 it scored on our citizen survey. It was the, I think it was the number one item. Well, it's nice when you can identify that uh, with what your voting public likes and what your, what your uh, uh, constituency wants. It's something that we all realize we need and uh, just needs to be taken care of. Uh, we have another call now. Uh, we've got Mike on line two. Mike, are you there? Yes, Mike from the Opportunity Network calling oh, in. How you doing, great, Mike? Great show, guys. We oh. love you. you guys Good to hear from Thank you. you. Yeah, a question for you. Relative to business, John. Yes, sir. What, what's in the offing for good things for business itself? For what have business? you got in plans? What can you share? Well, we did add a, a person called a business navigator when I first got on the city council two years ago at the urging, I believe, of Stephanie Morgan. I, I think it was Councilwoman mm -hmm. Morgan. She was big on that, and I think Jolene Caraballo. And we have a person that can help expedite getting business folks through the city bureaucracy. We're trying to streamline that so that we can get businesses open as quickly as possible. Um, we're, we're just getting very positive responses. We've opened up some Starbucks since I've been here. We have a Chick-fil-A coming. These are all things that people are asking for when I got on the city council. So, you know, I'm hearing that. We've had um, more upgraded quality um if you notice the st uh, starbucks on gatlin that mm -hmm. was a prototype building they're testing things out in our market we had a retail study done and we had people come in because we hear a lot of people wanting the cheesecake factory cheesecake they did a demographic study of our income in our local community and they found businesses that would be a good match for us and we asked this this group I believe they're out of the West, Midwest to work with us on trying to attract some of those businesses to the community. Mm -hmm. I think we're a very business-friendly council. I think we're tuned in to wanting to develop the local economy and make sure it's diversified so we don't wind up with a one-trade type economy or a two-trade, only service industries, and build it around some manufacturing, you know, trying to diversify the economy so we don't have any collapses. Yeah, it's important to get uh, small businesses involved, and also the, the commercial development obviously takes a lot of the tax burden off of the homeowners. Mm -hmm. And so if you have a decent commercial base, you have you spread that tax liability over a larger area. And, of course, uh, with, with the commercial people in there, uh, that that brings down the overall uh, tax burden on, the, on your citizens. So it's always good to have a... I don't know, probably 30%, 40% base of commercial, I think, yeah. in, uh, in any city is probably how they usually like to run it. Uh, Mike, what do you see? Uh, I know small businesses are, are the backbone uh, of our communities and of our country, as we spoke about when you were on the show a couple of weeks ago. Um, have, any update on the Opportunity Network? Yeah, the, the, well, the network is growing by leaps and bounds. You know, we're kind of a quiet organization. We just finally formed our own board. And uh, the outpouring of support has been phenomenal. Uh, business wants to know what goes on. I think the one thing that I saw go away that I personally would like to have happen again was at one point in time, you could um, actually get a notification about things that affect business in the town, like traffic and um, 
construction areas and things like that, making it a little easier for you know for groups of workers to get to where they need to be, that type of thing. I would like to see something like that happen where people can tune in. Maybe, maybe WPSL can do it, where you can tune in and go, hold on a second, I got to know what's out on the street, and I've got to know how to get around it and make things happen and not add to congestion, congestion and you know problems and that type of thing. Uh, the city, for me personally, for my business and for what you know what we do has been phenomenal and we've got nothing but support and three years ago we picked up the real estate expo yep we have been we have been sold out since we started it love to get some of the council people at the opening for that because i think you'll be stunned when you see the traffic and the caliber of people that come through there well i'm sure uh, we'll work on that and we'll get that uh, uh i think you're right to the source right now and we're going to Mike, I appreciate the call very much. Thank you. You be well. My pleasure, buddy. No problem. And, uh, Thank you, Mike. Cliff, you're going to take us to the next uh, I could break? probably do that because uh, well, the lines are still open if you'd like to call in because we are in the second half of the show. 772-340-1590. We'll be right back with more Issues and Answers in St. Lucie County. The Republican Party of St. Lucie invites you to meet your Republican candidates on Saturday, August 11th from noon till 4 p.m. at the Port St. Lucie Civic Center. Candidates from the school board to U.S. Congress and in between will be on hand. Come ask questions and get answers. No spin, no fake news, just you and the candidates. Get informed, be informed, vote informed. For more information, go to stlucygop.org. Paid for by the Republican Party of St. Lucie, not connected with any specific candidate. St. James Christian Academy is fully accredited and is now enrolling for fall, preschool through 12th grade, providing students with excellent education in a safe Christian environment for over 17 years. They offer dual enrollment, a Becca curriculum, transportation, affordable aftercare, STEM classes, sports, dance, and karate. St. James Christian Academy is now accepting fall enrollment applications. Plus, ask about their free tuition scholarships. Be a part of the excitement. Schedule a tour today or visit us at stjameschristianacademy.com. This is WPSL Port St. Lucie, the talk of the Treasure Coast. We now return to Issues and Answers in St. Lucie County with your host, Mark Gotts. Well, welcome back. Uh, just to remind you, our phone lines are open at 340-1590. And our guest tonight is John Carvelli, uh, Councilman for District 2 at City of Port St. Lucie. And we've been going over uh, the city, its budget, some of its past, uh, all of what's going on there right now. But, but John, let me ask you this. We're here today. Today is the present. We've talked about the past. So let's look at the future. What do you see as your vision for the city of Port St. Lucie in the next, say, five to ten years? Well, Mark, that's an excellent question because I think about it all the time. You know, when as the city grows, there's a lot of excitement, but we're, we are in a growth phase right now, and there's certain things we do need in the community. We, we do need certain types of businesses to relocate here. We need businesses to come here that could help sustain jobs so people could have quality employment in the community. But then the same token is we can't trade off the quality of life. We, we really can't give away the beautiful views as you drive around the city of the river and the tree lines that we see everywhere and watch them kind of evaporate. We have to be really careful. You know, the trade off to growth is sometimes the loss of an environment. And that, that's something that I've always thought about. You know, I've lived here since there were 5,000 residents in Port St. Lucie. And I remember wishing for growth, hoping we had growth, you know. Mm -hmm. Then we started seeing those growth spurts back in the 70s, late, mid, mid to late 70s. We had a growth spurt. I remember a growth spurt in the 80s, the mid 80s, up to about 89, 90, another spurt there. Then in 94, 96, things started hopping again. We want to make sure that we maintain a high quality of life for our residents. Do we want traffic congestion? Do we want overcrowding? Do we want multiple businesses of the same nature all over the city where, they're trip, where people are tripping over each other? 
you know, we have to really look at the way we grow. Uh, we're, we're going to eventually reach a point where we have to look at the way we grow and what we want to be in the long term. You know, I, I, I remember going down to West Palm back in the 70s and thinking what a great place it was. The whole county was 250,000 residents, 350,000 residents. Then it hit a half a million residents countywide, and it started really growing, you know. And with those growth, you want to avoid the pitfalls that come with high, fast, rapid growth and excessive growth. I think keeping our building profiles down to one to two story, three story is critical. I think the minute you start going vertical, you create congestion on the roadways. So, you know, I, I, I hope in the future the city council has a great, a real deep discussion on what we want to be in the future because we have some we have some room to grow right now we have land available we have a desire to grow we have to see new things crop up but we have to make sure we don't sacrifice what we have to just grow and i think keeping the the roadways well maintained with with trees and foliage as people drive down the road there's thick tree lines a good example of this is hilton head south carolina you could drive up and down the main road coming onto the island and not see any businesses hardly they're all they're all behind deep deep tree lines it's very it's one i think it's the only place in the country that has a master plan for um signs in the whole in the whole community you know it's got a, a master sign plan master hoa requirements through the whole community but as you drive through it's an appearance of low density um, beautiful views everywhere you go and um, high quality trees that help renourish the air you know you just have to think like that you want to make sure if a tree comes down that another tree's going up <laughs> we, we just don't want to pave and rip and strip and and leave open lines of sight we want people to enjoy the views and feel you know good about their community you know at the same token we want to have high paying jobs for people who live here so that they can sustain a good quality of life we don't want people to struggle i've seen over the years people go to school here get college educations and move away. We want those people to move back here and that's gonna require having the types of jobs or businesses that they can open that are needed in the community. So that's all I have to say on that subject. Yes, I think we've got a pretty good floor plan south of us in Dade, Broward and Palm Beach counties yeah. to, to learn from. Yeah. And I, I think growth that is measured and, and put in properly works well. I mean. Uh, there's a lot of studies, obviously, that the uh, Urban Land Institute has yeah. done on this. Uh, there's a lot of new urbanism down in uh, Dade and Broward counties. There's a big push for that, which is just what you're talking about, the high rises with the commercial in the first and second stories with maybe a little office over it. And uh, I know that there's there was a little bit of planning along the new ur urbanism uh, standpoint uh, at the county level. Uh, I think that's still kind of out for... Uh, for discussion, yeah. but it would be uh, it would be an impact, obviously, yeah. on on the county. If you look to just to our south in the next county, I worked there in the '80s, from '86 to '91, and Martin then back county? again in Martin County. I can tell you that there's a strong objection to any type of growth, and with that comes a higher responsibility of, of the tax the individual taxpayer shoulder, shouldering the cost of road repairs, school replacements. So what will happen in the life cycle of roads, schools, um, utility infrastructure, sewage, uh, um, stormwater sewage systems, water retention, over time, if you don't have some form of sustainable growth at a certain level, then the burden of, of repairing and replacing all of that will fall on the taxpayer. And the cost of living will go up, mm -hmm. and, and infrastructure repairs will occur at a very slow pace. So you have to be careful. You can have anti-growth or you can have excessive growth. We have to find a balance in between there so that people can feel really good about the community where they live. And I, I do feel good with this city council. We really focus on parks and recreation. We have the golf course. It has been actually our golf course made money for a number of years. Really? One of the few municipal golf courses in the uh, in the state that was showing a profit. They were reinvesting. Did you know that this year there were 47,000 rounds played at the Saints, the city's golf course, the Saints golf the Saints course, course. Yes. 47,000 rounds, a single golf course, no backup golf course. They were able to maintain that even with rain days and maintenance days. So, 
You know, it's. It, I think it's a great city. It's got a lot of great amenities. We have Club Med. We have the Riverwalk we're going to develop. We have to have the quality nightlife for people to want to stay here as well. That was always something growing up that really it didn't offer much. You know, an occasional isolated little establishment here and there. <laughs> and then you realize when you drove to West Palm Beach, wow, they have a lot going on here. But we want to make sure we have a balance with quality of life and what we offer, what the community could offer its residents. Now, what is our population currently in the uh, city of Port St. Lucie? Mark, I believe it's 189, 189,000. We are probably two-thirds of the county's population now. And how much land do we have in, in the city? I believe it's 120 square miles. All right. How much of that is now developed? I'm not sure on the amount of single-family lots that are left, mm -hmm. but I'm, I'm not 100% sure. I have to check. I will say that we picked up McCarty Ranch, 5,000 acres right. off Glades Cutoff Road, and we annexed it into the city. I would like to see that stay as a passive kind of outdoor recreational area. We're going to use a portion of it to store storm um, water mm -hmm. runoff right. coming out of the canals and filter it so it can cut some of these algae blooms that will affect the river. The river is a critical part of the city. When the river has issues with it, what we wind up with having to close off swimming areas, boating areas, fishing areas, club meds affected with their waterfront. Mm -hmm. So our riverfront would be affected. So we have to be uh, careful. We are paying for a microbial study to be done. We have a scientist that presented at the retreat the other day that we're trying to locate what the source is for some of these microbial agents that are affecting the water. And we're, we're getting there. We're working on it. It's just very slow. We have trace elements put in septic tanks, in canals. We're trying to identify where the, where the origins are so that we could stop the uh, water problem and be part of that solution with the, in, that the region's facing. Yeah, that's the biggest thing because there's a lot of discussion about Lake Okeechobee uh, being the basis of all of the problems we have and the Kissimmee River running in and polluting the, uh, lake, the lake. And then that's the lake, weird. when it fills up, has the discharges running back and forth down to Colossahoochee and, and, of course, to St. Lucie. And so St. Lucie. These are uh, these We do are have 17,000 uh, homes still on septic tanks in mm -hmm. the city. So if there's leakage, cracking in the septic tank, and the water table rises, it'll carry that effluent away from there, and it could drop into a canal somewhere and just create a little runoff, and then it forms and it moves through the canal. So we have to look at you know keeping the water quality. You remember in Miami years ago, they had a problem with the Miami River, I think sure. it was, many years ago. Very polluted. Oh, it became polluted, and it just was bad. You know? They were able to get it cleaned up, and, yep. and this is one thing that drives me nuts because – from a political standpoint, we throw money at a problem, and then we think we've cured it because we've thrown money at the problem. But uh, like you take the uh, Lake Okeechobee and, and the problems we're talking about now with water, uh, we've spent $650 million to basically clean up this problem, yet we still have the problem. Yeah, we still have the problem. Uh, Everybody has a different solution for it. Some want to want to stop the water north of Lake Okeechobee. Some want to build things south of Lake Okeechobee. Um, there's a lot of talk about fortifying Lake Okeechobee Fortif because we only get. I, I think they start to draw uh, down. Draw down, draw down at 14 feet now, yep. and it used to take 19. Feet. 19, 17, 18, then 19 came come down to, uh, I think about 14 feet. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so if we can if we could fortify the lake. And put another three or four feet in the lake, which is like what, ninety mile perimeter. Yep. Uh, that would take uh, strengthen that, that berm. Certainly. If you ever go out there, I go out to Bell Glade often, and you realize just how close that lake is to the housing that people live around it. Mm -hmm. And a washout or a break in the berm could cause a, a catastrophe over there. Yeah, we yeah. do. We do need to fortify that. Okay. So. Where do you think the population of Port St. Lucie will end up? You think we'll have 400,000 people? You think we'll have 250,000 in stop? Uh, what, what's your crystal ball say? I don't, I don't know, but I think in the near future we're going to have to start having some discussions about that and to making some decisions. I think the estimated build-out is 450,000. We have to say, what do we want to be when we're at 450,000 and 350 and 250,000? So we really have to look at where we want to be and what we want to be at those markers along the way. So, you know, we, once again, you know, as, a, as I grow older and I've been here so long, 
we want to make sure we have a quality of life that everyone wants to be here and enjoy, you know, a city that everyone can enjoy. That's why we're called City for All Ages. <laughs> and let's keep Port St. Lucie beautiful. <laughs> Very good. Well, I appreciate it. Uh, John, thank you for joining us this pleasure. evening. Uh, it's, it's, it's been a pleasure to hear, to get an update on the city of Port St. Lucie and to have you here. Uh, next week, we're going to have a uh, guest host, which is going to be Ron Parrish. Oh. You're uh, not going to be here next week? I'm not going to be here next week. And, and okay. Cliff, you know, I may not be here the following week also mm, for that? other reasons. But next week, same, you're going to learn on idea. hurricane preparedness. I would encourage everyone to become informed about the sales tax referendum that is coming up in November. Mm -hmm. I, I do owe that a plug for Port St. Lucie. If we do, if that was to pass, we would have more money for repaving and sidewalks and um, roadway projects. But I encourage everyone to go to our website and cityofportstlucie.com and and learn about the sales tax referendum that is coming up. We did want to put that decision in the hands of the voters. Yes, I'm glad you did put it in the hands of the voters because, you know, I'm a, I'm a firm believer that if somebody's going to pay a tax, they should know what it's about and uh, if they're going to give away their money. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, once again, I feel that uh, government too often just throws money at a problem and doesn't, doesn't cause a solution. But uh, next week, like I said, Ron Parrish on Hurricane Preparedness, he's uh, the Emergency Operations Center lead. Uh, he is... Um, he was also previously the fire chief here and uh, had a lot of interaction with, with Ron uh, for several years while he was on there. And now that he retired and moved over to the uh, EOC, it's going to be a pleasure to have him on this, this coming week. Great person. And then, Cliff, you going to cover for me the following week, or do I have to bring in another host? You probably might want to bring in an, another host uh, because, uh, well, I, I've got a credibility problem when it comes to politics. I'm too much of a smart aleck, but I can push these buttons just right for you. Hmm. And you do or a good job of it, send, too, Cliff. Or, or whoever you send. <coughs> but uh, you know how politics uh, brings about a lot of grief in mere conversation with folks. You know? A lot of times it can bring out the worst in people. Oh, yes. I have relatives <laughs> that uh, I, I play with them. And, and you know how you know how on, on Rudy's show, if the calls aren't coming in, I'll take a devil's advocate stand to get the phones ringing. I don't want to have to do that here. Well, you may be able to lead the conversation in a couple of weeks. We'll see. Otherwise, we'll get you guest host. <laughs> well, is this a weekly? It's a weekly. This is a weekly, John. Yes. So wow. uh, I'd like to wish everybody well. Have a great week. And look forward to hearing, seeing you in a couple of, or list, speaking with you in a couple of weeks, I should say. Thank you. And enjoy it next week for the uh, emergency uh, hurricane preparedness. Hey, emergency hurricane preparedness next week on Issues and Answers in St. Lucie County, hosted by Mark Gotts. Of course, next week he won't be here. He'll have a guest host, but you're invited to tune in. And also remember, there are archives of this show on YouTube. Just go to WPSLTV.com and, uh, and find them. This one will be up here uh, oh, by tomorrow night. I think I'll have it up there for you. In the meantime, the sage of South Central L.A., Larry Elder, coming up. Great stuff for you after the news from CBS. This is WPSL Port St. Lucie. The talk of the Treasure Coast serving 25 years and counting.